show is here. Yo, our mission is clear. It's time to change healthcare. Have no fear. Today is the day. This is the hour. Together, you know we've got the power. Drop the silos. We're all the same team. Experience, business, tech, and marketing. How can anyone be satisfied with the way things have always been? Yeah, we've tried. So join us now. Join the revolution. Consumer first health is the evolution. Status quo, more like status no. Yeah, this is the healthcare rap. Y'all, come on, let's go. New choices, new platforms, new care models. In the healthcare of tomorrow, consumers win. But who will design it? What will it look like? And how long will it take? We're here to answer those questions with some provocative thinking about how to create the healthcare that people actually want. Ready to roll up your sleeves, look at the world a little differently, and explore the frontiers of consumer health together? Join us. This is the Healthcare Wrap. Hey, it's Jared Johnson from Shift Forward Health, and here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about Costco's new $29 primary care visits. Are we getting to the point where just about any consumer brand can follow the model of same-day visits plus low prices, and will it help fill gaps in accessibility and affordability? I'll talk about that. Then Mitch Holdwick joins me for another Disruptor Profile. Mitch and I evaluate CityBlock Health's approach as a value-based provider for historically marginalized populations. Even with layoffs earlier this year, the company remains in a strong position to play a part in providing care for those who are historically left behind. Lots to talk about, so it's time to dive right in. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the week. Ready for amazing care at Costco prices? Costco is the latest consumer brand to enter the primary care space with an announcement that they now offer online health checkups to members for as low as $29. They're offering the new service in partnership with Sesame, a direct-to-consumer healthcare marketplace that connects medical providers nationwide with consumers. Their platform does not accept health insurance because it primarily caters to uninsured Americans and those with high deductible plans who prefer to pay cash for their health care. They say their model helps keep prices of services low for its users. Costco members can now book visits directly through their memberships in all 50 states. The menu includes virtual primary care visits for $29, health checkups that include a standard lab panel and virtual follow-up consultation for $72, and online mental health visits for $79. There's also an additional 10% off specialty visits. I decided to take a quick test drive. There's a link on Costco Pharmacy's homepage that takes you to Sesame's site. Once you're there, you're greeted with the message, Amazing Care, Costco Prices, and a description about booking a $29 virtual care visit in minutes with five-star providers. Same day, no wait times. Right below that, it's a message about finding the best price for the best online care, so it's really easy to see how they're positioning themselves. From there, you can search by symptom, by specialty, or by most popular type of visits. You can toggle a setting to just look for providers who are available within two hours, and you can view available providers' ratings, reviews, pricings, headshots, and available time slots for that day, all without a single click. All of the information is already served up right there in front of you. I have to say it's one of the easiest scheduling dashboards that I've ever seen, and I wouldn't be opposed if other providers copied this limited menu style as opposed to trying to be the Cheesecake Factory. It's funny, but with so many new players offering primary care services, it might feel like a crowded space, except it isn't. There aren't enough primary care providers now, and we're heading towards a potentially existential shortage in the coming years. So is it any wonder that Costco is getting into this space? Curating who they consider to be best in class at a significant discount is what they do. I almost wonder what's taken them so long to get here. At any rate, their new service seems to check a lot of boxes when it comes to a consumer first experience. Same day visits, no wait times, virtual option, price transparency, and being a benefit of an existing membership. Are we getting to the point where just about any consumer brand can follow this model with success? We'll see. But one thing's for sure, Costco will not be the last ones to try it. Let's continue to watch as consumer and retail brands find ways to fill gaps in accessibility and affordability and see what parts of their formula we can copy in other settings. That's another way that we'll build the healthcare of tomorrow. And that's the flavor of the Week. All right, let's get into the flow. I'm back here with Mitch Holdwick. I just refer to him as Mitch. He's kind of the one name wonder now. Mitch, how you been? I'm good. I'm good, Jared. How have things been going for you? You know, good. I'm really proud of myself. I've been working on kicking habits. I have, and I credit my wife for this, but I have a bad habit of buying coffee every single day. And she challenged me to start making 
coffee rather than going to my local Starbucks, which I love to do with their mobile app. But I have now, since we're while we're recording, I think I'm on like month two of brewing coffee every day on my own and not buying coffee. So I just wanted to give myself a pat on the back and encourage others to find a habit to kick. Love that. Well, I'll give you a pat on the back too, man. Congrats on that. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I love that. You know what, quite frankly, what one thing I enjoy about our Consumer First Health Group calls is at the beginning when we're doing intros and we invite people to share some good news about their life. That doesn't have to be about work. Sometimes yeah. it is. That's one of my favorite parts of those calls is just to hear, like, just give me some good news about your life. I don't even know you that well, but tell me something cool, something good that's going on in your life. Like, it's it's a it's a great energy. It's a great vibe. And it just gets things started off in the right way. And that, that's what I think of every, every time. You know, we just get to reconnect here. It's like, there's just some good energy here. There's some a good vibe of... Hey, you know, we're going to talk about some disruptors. We're going to give our assessment, a, a profile, if you will, of another cool group today that is doing really good work. What, what do you say we just get right into this? Let's do it. All right. Today, we're focused on city block health. And let's start off at the beginning with these guys. And then what we'll do is describe some of the parts of their story, if you will, some of the news headlines that have come out, some basics about them, and then we'll discuss their disruptive potential. We'll give them a grade as we've been doing with some of the other disruptors. If you haven't tuned in yet to some of our previous episodes, we've been doing this these profiles for a while. Our most recent ones include Alidade, Firefly Health, and Crossover Health. And now we're talking about City Blocks. So without further ado, City Block, here's some basics. So they're at the core, they're a tech-driven healthcare provider for those in underserved communities. So this is going to be different. So City Block is interesting because they combine primary care, behavioral health, and chronic disease management services that address social determinants of health. Things like transportation, housing, and access to healthy food, they focus on marginalized populations. So unlike a traditional doctor's office, the model prioritizes caring for its members when and where it's convenient for them in the community outside of hospitals and outside of doctor's offices whenever it's reasonable. And then in their homes, they they help revive home visits in impoverished neighborhoods. Mitch, I think that's just a great place to start. It's a great place to just see, wow, like what kind of great work are, are they doing? What, what else, what are the basics should we mention about these guys? Yeah, I think, in, in, and just to dig a little deeper into that point, Jared, their mission to really focus on the underserved populations comes through loud and clear, not only in their website, but in their annual report. I, I dug into that a little bit. And a few statistics I'd love to read off in terms of showcasing their commitment to focusing on the most vulnerable. Almost 90% of their members are Medicaid or dual eligible beneficiaries. Almost 90%, 85% of the members have two plus chronic conditions. So they're focusing on populations with some of the nuanced and complex clinical conditions. And almost half of the members have a behavioral health need, while over just over 60% of the members have an identified acute social need. So I thought those were really powerful statistics and a great way to, again, show their commitment to reaching out to those that are underserved and to really focusing on areas that are in need of their services. And I was really inspired by Dr. Toilin Ajayi, who is the CEO and co-founder of CityBlock. You can tell they're a very data-driven organization. As she speaks on the website and different talks, she mentioned another statistic that kind of put into perspective what they do in She mentioned Indiana as an example in the United States, ranks 48th in public health funding. 60% of neighborhoods are pharmacy deserts, which is double the national average. So more than half of the counties lack sufficient access to behavioral health support. And the fact that she was able to, you know, speak to that off the top of her head, I'm sure she's done a lot of research and others within CityBlack have done that as well speaks to, A, the fact that they are really committed to the most vulnerable, as described by the statistics I read off from the report, but then also they're committed to going, really going into the areas where there is a need based on some of those statistics and where they rank nationally. So I was just really inspired 
by their commitment to focusing on those that are, are underserved within the United States. I agree. Dr. Ajayi is just inspirational in how she's leading this group. I found it interesting that they spun out of, of Alphabet, so Google's parent, Alphabet. Alphabet's subsidiary was called Sidewalk Labs. CityBlock spun out of Sidewalk Labs in 2017. And since then, they've opened up clinics in Brooklyn, Queens, Connecticut, Massachusetts, North Carolina. And just like we talked about with Crossover last time about the hybrid of in-person and virtual care, there's something to that, right? When we try to look at some of the transferable or trends, the things that are not just happening at one of these disruptors, but the things they have in common, one of those absolutely is vetting out the ability for hybrid care, for in-person and virtual care, depending on needs. And I think the proliferation of that, though, is giving us an insight. It's helping us see who's really paying attention to what consumers want and need. And whether you need some data that says, okay, people told me in a survey that they'd like both, or whether it's just actually speaking to enough people where you understand, if we can make this work and make it available in person and virtually, we're probably going to be able to serve a better population. Now, let's build around that need. And again, a lot of these disruptive, non-traditional primary care players were not spun out of approach to care. I think it's safe to say a lot of them were created in the first place because somebody recognized the need. They saw the gaps in care. They saw the opportunities to design and experience and actually lead with that experience and have that be their differentiator instead of just saying, hey, we're going to present everything in the same way and still make you wait and have all the friction in a healthcare experience. They're doing their best because where does that friction exist the most? Absolutely, in underserved communities. And instead of just ignoring that or just building a model somewhere else and saying, I'm sure I'm I'm just going to leave that to other people or leave it to nonprofit health systems to say that's part of their community contribution, which how much everyone's been paying attention to this, but there's a firestorm right now in terms of there was a hit, think of it as a hit piece, but it it was a lot of fact finding in the Wall Street Journal. I want to say it was in December about a lot of nonprofit health systems, community contribution that they have to report wasn't even close to the amount that it needed to be for them to still technically have a nonprofit designation. So that's going to keep being talked about. And when you have a force out there like City Block, that's all they're doing, pretty much. That's where their focus is. Let's bring care to those who otherwise either have a physical or social or other reason to not seek care, to not trust the traditional system. There are so many needs here. We, we could spend the rest of the time just talking about how that's beneficial to society, how that's beneficial to individual consumers, how it's individual to communities. I just think there, there is a lot to say about it. I'm glad you brought up just the, the mission-based part of it here. On, on their website, let me just read this little statement that they have. Because how often, again, when I focus on marketing messages, that's how a lot of these new, these disruptors are referring to themselves. They're referring to themselves in a different way. And right on their about page, there's a title that says, we see you. How often do you see that on, on a healthcare provider page, first and foremost? But let me just read this real quick. It's, I think it's very indicative of who they are and what they're trying to do. It says, we see you. We see healthcare as a basic human right, not luck of the draw, not based on where you were born or the way you look. The way we see it, healthcare should be available to you no matter your circumstance, but not healthcare as it exists now. Something different, radically different, an approach that puts you first, knowing that everything affects your health. So you will no longer feel neglected and ignored by a healthcare system that doesn't include everyone or be judged before being diagnosed. We believe in caring for you in looking you in the eye and asking how you're really doing because we listen to you, we understand you, Simply put, we see you. And then it ends with be seen, be heard, be healthy. If anyone wants to know what they're all about, there it is. And they're addressing some very real, very authentic perceptions and reasons that are very legitimate, very real about why people don't engage with the existing healthcare system. I think that's really interesting. That's not just, I I don't get the impression at all. That's just marketing speak, right? Like that's, this is really who they are and how they feel. Yeah, and it speaks to your I mean, you've done a good job, Jared, of mentioning this trend in these groups, these innovators and disruptors that are, are getting more intentional with their words and messaging so that it's a combination of calling out the current approach and the current traditional 
aspects of healthcare in a challenging way, but in a con- constructive, challenging way, but also messaging that resonates with their members or folks that could potentially benefit from their services. So it's you're right, there, there continues to be this trend of forcing us to collectively look in the mirror a little bit as an industry, but also helping members and, and community members see the, the benefit of what could be. It's really cool to be able to be so mission focused in an industry that is already very mission focused, quite frankly. And I hope that comes through. I hope it's not, hey, us versus them, right. or hey, they're more mission focused than us. I always try to reiterate this as part of the Consumer First Manifesto that we've shared and published last year, which is we appreciate and highly value the work that clinicians do every single day. They save people's lives, they improve the quality of life, they heal people, and we don't want to take away from that. What we're saying is we're not done yet. There's still a lot of room to go on this road. And we want to get there faster. We want to remove friction from that journey. And so it's probably just worth saying that because I don't want anyone to take away from, hey, we're saying we're, we're disparaging traditional healthcare in any way, which we're not. We're saying we're absolutely fans. We've all been part of health systems, hospitals, provider organizations. We understand it. We believe in it. We're part of it. Now look at what we've been able to identify by sharing our stories, by talking more, by building a community around building a consumer first version of healthcare, which is at the end of the day, easier to encounter. That's not just easier for people who have a lot of money or people who are in a certain, you know, were born in a certain zip code or live in a certain zip code. It's absolutely the goal that it's easier for everyone at whatever level they are. And that includes being able to trust the type of care that someone's providing. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that part up. It's just worth mentioning that just because we we're fans of what a disruptor is doing, that does not disparage all the work that's going on every single day. On the financial side, there's a lot of speculation about any non-traditional form of care. There's a lot of money vested in traditional care. I want to be clear on that in terms of it's not one or the other. And yet there is still a, a status quo. There's gravity that keeps us from wanting to innovate because there's a lot of people whose businesses thrive on the existing business model, on the existing weights. So it's not all or nothing. There's a lot of nuance here. And that's one reason why it's so complicated. There's so many parties involved in providing care and paying for it. So the fact that City Health can play in this space and make such a difference and be growing so quickly. I mean, they're a relatively new startup. I mean, they've they were founded in 2017. And then in December 2020 is when they hit a one billion dollars valuation. May 2022, so a year and a half later, was that 6.3 billion dollar valuation. I mean, that's remarkable. That does tell me ideally there could be something here, right? There there could be value business growth in being able to provide care in the right way. It, re- it does remind me a lot of groups like Chen Med and Oak Street, who, Chen Med in particular, when we've been able to have Dr. Gordon Chen on as our guest, and then uh, a couple of other guests there too. We've had Tim Barry from Village MD, who reminds me a lot of the same thing in terms of, instead of getting stuck on the term value-based care or on, on the term full risk, they've been doing it for a long time, years and years. And they've been able to show in Village MD's case, they have their Village Medical at Home practice, which does house calls, been able to weave that into a value-based care framework and have shown that they can reduce hospitalizations, they can improve quality of care. In Chen Med's case, they can absolutely point to all sorts of data that show that there's a business model to be built around taking care of somebody not just in a full fee-for-service world, because we're still in a majority fee-for-service world. But there really is a business model there. And there are people who say, well, there never will be. And yet, here we are. These guys are worth $6.3 billion. Now, the caveat here on the financial side is that in June of 2023, they announced a restructuring of their business to ramp up their payer partnerships and accelerate their path to profitability. And that included a layoff of 155 employees or 12% of their workforce. They did say that was necessary to right-size the business as they entered this new phase of growth. 
And we haven't heard a lot since that announcement. They did try to make the point that while a lot of other digital health companies have laid off employees in the past year as global economic headwinds have made it difficult to raise capital or grow revenues, they said that's not the case for them. They're in a place of financial strength. So we don't know exactly what that means, uh, but this is just part of the story that we want to include. What else sticks out to you about them? I just, I you know, love the, they're kind of going back to their commitment to serving the vulnerable populations. And one of my favorite definitions of mercy is the willingness to enter into the chaos of another. And I've mentioned that before, uh, maybe on other interviews, but it's so important to me. And I think of the work they're doing, it just, it really emulates that, that willingness to enter into the chaos of another, not just through the, the data that supports their work, but everything you've mentioned, there really is a commitment to doing not just the easy stuff, doing the, the work that's hard and, and to work in areas that are marginalized and where there really is a need for their services. So I just wanted to call that out to an aspect of their mission that I think is really critical. Yeah, that's really, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that part. I'm just looking at the formula behind what they're doing. Right. The fact that they've been able to attract people like Andy Slavitt, who is the, the former head of the federal government's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. He's on their board of directors. He's he was quoted in 2020 saying we need a city block in every community that we've ignored for too long and where the odds stack against people to live a healthy life. I mean, again, that just comes back to how do we actually deliver this? At least as of again, May 2022, they were reported to have over 70,000 members. Overall, and again, that is not easy to be responsible for that many those many lives for that much care. I don't want it to get lost in all the headlines of Amazon and CVS and United and Optum. Someone serving seventy thousand people is absolutely amazing. Like it's crazy. I mean, it's it's so much work. There's a dignity associated with this work that I don't want to get lost in all the 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 p's and q's of hey, they're tech first, right? They're they use cloud computing. They use machine learning to to support the the care that they're providing and to target with where to build, where to care. Yes, that's true. That's probably one of the main reasons why a company like this can be out there. But let's not lose sight of the fact of all the work that's happening here and where it can get us as a society. So I love always having a chance to insert that into the conversation and help us understand that when there are people advocating for non-traditional healthcare. As recently as just a few days ago, when I've mentioned ideas like that, I still get pushback from people saying, well, wait, does that mean we're trying to get people out of a job who work in traditional medicine? And I'm just like, that's such a scarcity mentality. Like, let's not lose sight of what healthcare is all about. Mm -hmm. Uh, The business systems behind it, underneath it, at the foundation of it, weren't built with consumers' needs in mind. And as a result, we have an experience that's hard, that drives people away from seeking care that they need. So anything that helps us get to a better place in my mind is good. I love all the good work that's happening in traditional medicine and traditional healthcare settings and hospitals and health systems. I also love hearing about organizations like CityBlock that are uh, targeting things in a different way that don't have to worry about all the ins and outs, all the complexities of a traditional care model because they can figure out just the parts that make sense for them I think that's why we have so much innovation happening right now. And it's just one of the the pieces that I like to always come back to recognizing that, yeah, you know what, this, again, all of this isn't binary. It's not, hey, it's either traditional medicine or non-traditional. It's everyone combined. And I always look for ways to take that step back and say, look, let's get to a better place as a society, as a country. Let's provide care. Let's provide more choices. We're not uh, shoving a choice on somebody we are making room for more opportunities. It's an abundance mentality, and that's what I'll stick with <laughs> myself. Yeah, no, it's a good point, Jared. I think the theme that comes up in our consumer first healthcare group, too, that it, it, these disruptors and innovators, despite the fact that it may, some people may question how that could threaten employment opportunities for others. But I think what it is, to your point, it's a blend of creating all these options so that consumers can find that path of least resistance and knowing that one, whether it's city block or other organizations we've covered in these profiles, one may not be best for a certain person. It just depends on where they're at in their life. And the more options we can create, 
and the more frictionless experiences we can design, it ultimately creates better experiences and, and pushes us to be better as a whole collectively. So it's not one or the other. It's not the dichotomy of this or that. It's a combination of everything working together to ultimately provide a better experience. Totally agree. All right. Well, Mitch, let's let's give these guys a grade. It says in terms of their disruptive potential, what grade would you give these guys out of one to 10? I, I had them at a seven, but then listening to you talk about the growth they've had, and I'm starting to question my, my grade, but I'm going to stick with a, a seven. It's still a solid score. And I think where they have opportunity to grow is just to see more of the good work they're already doing. They're still a pretty young company, as you mentioned, being founded in 2017. So I'm give them a seven with the caveat that I que- I almost gave them an eight after listening to, to some of your findings on their valuation. I like it. No, that makes sense. I think I'm going to stick with an eight on these guys. And the only reason I wouldn't make it higher is because still they're still relatively new in the space. And so the long-term trajectory for you know, being able to, to do what we consider disrupting the, the industry, meaning or displacing existing business models, there, there's a whole definition of disruptive innovation and what that means. Well, disruptive innovation in the eyes of the Clayton Christensen Institute, for instance, is increasing access and affordability of existing services. And so in that case, the disruption is high, is uh, here. So if I go strictly by that definition, I'm more likely to even give them like, like move that up to an eight and a half or a nine. Uh, I think I'll stick with the eight because... Yeah, there's still some things left to prove. And can they continue that growth? And what's the long-term social benefit here? I think their opportunity to impact society, the overall health and wellness of, of society, particularly in underserved communities, which ends up having a ripple effect and lowering the overall cost of care in the country, I think that's huge. And so I'm going to say eight and a half, kind of cheating a little bit because now that I, now that I think through it, we'll go there. All right. <laughs> Well, uh, this, is, this has been good, man. I really enjoy doing these. I, I like diving deep. And again, we mention every time that this is just based on publicly available information. We're just looking at it through the lens of, of other disruptors, of other trends we're seeing. But uh, we'll definitely be keeping our eyes on these guys as well. Uh, looking forward to seeing where their growth takes them next and how it affects communities in, in the country. So uh, any other final thoughts? None for me. Just thanks for having me on as always. It's always a pleasure and uh, can't wait to do it again. Outstanding. Well, that's a wrap for this episode. I've had the pleasure of speaking with Mitch Holdwick again, the one name wonder, just Mitch, right? <laughs> We've been talking about City Block Health and, and their disruptive potential. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again. Thank you.